particularly pleased uh, to have Grayson Rich because he is an incoming fellow. And we're also particularly pleased because he's, uh, I know some of you subscribe to Science Magazine, but uh, what he's going to talk about was on the cover of Science Magazine on September 15th, the uh, first observation of coherent electron, coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering. I finally got that right. Um, and uh, not only did you all read this, I mean, so first of all, the picture is absolutely beautiful. And uh, getting that beautiful image was so difficult that uh, there is an article about how the photographer got uh, the image. Where's, I'm trying to see Juan. Oh, there Juan. Are you there? Juan smiling? Yes, there, there were a lot of uh, uh, Groundhog Day jokes uh, made uh, by the Anyway, this is a real milestone. Before I tell you a little bit about uh, Grayson, I just want to mention that this prediction of uh, coherent scattering was a big deal in 1974. And I see two or three people in the room who were alive in 1974. And uh, Dan Friedman uh, at MIT wrote a paper uh, about neutral currents and pointed out that this process, uh, the cross-section due to coherence would be increased by A squared. And so if you had a nucleus with A, like, you know, pick a nice, healthy number like 300, well 300 is pretty big, but it's a number that I can square. <laughs> the cross-section would increase by about a factor of 100,000. And when you're talking about neutrino scattering, that, that's, a, that's a really big deal. And uh, that had big implications. Uh, the neutral currents weren't clearly established at that time. Uh, at least, well, that's a whole other story about the neutral currents. I see Jim Pilcher smiling. Um, but that would be a really big deal in astrophysics. And various astrophysicists at the University of Chicago, including Dave Fram and Rocky Cobb, wrote papers about the importance of the neutral currents in astrophysics. But this coherent process had never been seen until this summer. And that's what Grayson's going to tell us about. So as I mentioned, Grayson is, is an incoming fellow in the KICP. Um, he was an undergraduate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And uh, he is also a graduate student there. And his PhD advisor, uh, let's see, he got his BS in 2010. And he will get his PhD on September 29th. 2017. And so for those of you looking at your calendar watches, you'll realize that that is Friday. So we all have to be wishing him good thoughts. But this is a dry run for his uh, PhD thesis. So his advisor uh, is Phil Barbeau, who uh, was one water student and got his PhD at the University of Chicago in 2009. Um, and I was kind of looking at other things about uh, uh, Grayson, so you're going to have to uh, I try to do research on the speakers. And so uh, I noticed something interesting. He'll fit in at Chicago very well because one of the things he's been involved in uh, is the Energy and Security uh, Policy Seminar at the Triangle Institute for Security Studies. So his interests go beyond uh, uh, science. And he's also a tweeter. In fact, you know, I was looking at his tweets, and if I understood how to use Twitter, uh, you know, he might be up there with uh, Donald Trump on the tweet. Although the thing that I did notice, well, Trump has a lot of followers. Uh, but what I did notice is that, you know, once he really got into his PhD work, the number of tweets went down, and they were about things like, you know, neutron detection and, uh, you know, more about science. Uh, which is good. The undergraduate tweets, I didn't understand all of them. Uh, and maybe maybe I'm not supposed to, and maybe some of them should have been deleted. You know? <laughs> okay, uh, we're very pleased to have Grace, and we're uh, very pleased to welcome to our community, and we look forward to uh, hearing about this uh, big discovery of the summer. Well, uh, thanks, and uh, thanks for the comparison with Trump. That's that's great, uh, but uh, I am very privileged uh, to be here today to talk about this result that we've had. Um, and before I get started, I absolutely need to recognize that this is a 
the result of a tremendous effort by a large number of people involved in the coherent collaboration, and of course, Juan Guayarni's uh, particular, oh, his own particular debt of gratitude by all of us uh, for a lot of the work that he's done. We'll talk a little bit about that as we get into it. Um, so I'm going to step back in time a little bit, um, and, 19, and get back actually to the beginning of the history of the neutrino. Uh, and it started in 1930 when it was predicted by Pauli to explain the continuous beta decay spectrum that was observed, but wasn't wasn't understood. And when he made this prediction, uh, he made the comment that I have done a terrible thing, and I have postulated particles that cannot be detected. Now, was the idea of the weak interaction was defined by Fermi in 1934, uh, and then Beta and Perils calculated the inverse beta decay cross section and made another comment that was pretty interesting. They said that because of the magnitude of the cross section that they calculated. Therefore, it's absolutely impossible to observe processes of, these kind, of this kind. Now, whether or not these statements were intended to do this, they guaranteed that experimentalists would be chomping at a bit to observe these neutrinos. Uh, and indeed, um, when Fred Reines was uh, recounting in his Nobel lecture what had motivated him and his collaborator, uh, Clyde Cowan, to begin undertaking this problem, they said they were looking for a real challenging problem, and they uh, undertook the detection of the free neutrino because everybody said you couldn't do it. Um, so this was back in the early 1950s, and it was a, a bit of a different time then, especially for people who work in the weapons program, uh, like Cowan and Rhinus. Um, so when they had to uh, think about what might be a prudent source of neutrinos, uh, they settled, of course, on nuclear weapons. Um, so they decided to build an incredibly uh, sensitive uh, detector, um, about two tons, and suspend it at the top of about a hundred foot uh, drop, which they would evacuate underground. Um, and then at about the time when they would detonate a nuclear weapon on the surface, uh, they would drop their two-ton detector, but everything would be fine because it would land on the bed of feathers. Um, so they proposed this experiment, and they got approved. <laughs> Why not? Um, it's actually got the blessing of Fermi, and they began uh, digging their hole. So they gave a seminar uh, at Los Alamos, and uh, one of the people in attendance asked them to reconsider um, and begged them to sort of see if maybe they could do this at a nuclear reactor. Uh, so they sat down uh, and they recognized that there was something they hadn't considered the first time when they were considering uh, this experiment. And by using coincidences, uh, which is sort of a timing topological thing that they could uh, exploit in the inverse beta decay process, uh, they'd be able to reject backgrounds and they could in fact do this uh, at a nuclear reactor, which uh, produces neutrinos much in the same way as the as the nuclear weapons actually. Um, they tried first at uh, Hanford site, um, and as Cowan would recount in a lecture now on YouTube, um, he said, we discovered cosmic rays. Now, of course, they've been discovered before, but they actually hadn't considered them when they were planning the experiment. Uh, so the background was a little bit too much at the Hanford site. They redid it at the Savannah River plant in 1956. They published two papers, one in science, one in nature, um, describing the detection of the free neutrino. So, skipping forward a little bit, um, in the early 1970s, apparently maybe there's some people here who were involved in neutral currents. Um, but in the early 1970s, uh, the standard model, as we now know it, had begun to coalesce. And uh, one of the things uh, that was interesting about it was that it predicted the existence of a weak neutral current, which had never been uh, observed before. And then in 1973, the Gardner Mobile Bubble Chamber at CERN uh, provided experimental evidence uh, for this neutral current. Uh, they observed uh, neutrino and electron scattering events. And then, uh, as uh, Mike said, um, in 1974, soon after uh, the evidence for this neutral current uh, was, was provided, uh, Dan Freeman made this prediction uh, for the coherent uh, elastic neutrino nucleus scattering process, or uh, SEVENS as we style it now. Um, so in, uh, in considering this, uh, this new neutral current, um, Friedman realized that uh, in a way very analogous to electron uh, nucleus scattering, the neutral current should facilitate the coherent scattering uh, of neutrinos off of nuclei. And the distinguishing feature uh, of the coherent scattering process is that the nucleons uh, in the recoiling nucleus all recoil in phase. So we can calculate scattering amplitude, uh, the contributions from the nucleons uh, all add prior to the square, um, and ultimately, uh, oh, Friedman, Friedman's prediction certainly uh, suggested the scaling would go like the number of nucleons squared because uh, of the relatively small weak charge of the proton. Cross-section squared is approximately like the number of neutrons uh, in the nucleus squared. Um, 
So uh, in the paper where he predicted uh, the existence of this process, he also said that any attempt to make a measurement of it might be an act of hubris. Uh, so again, this would of course guarantee that people would want to do it. Um, but he justified this assertion for, uh, with a couple of different reasons, and he was quite right with all of them. Um, so one of the primary challenges uh, associated with observing coherence scattering is that the only trace of the interaction is a low energy recoiling nucleus. Um, so this is a, makes it a very challenging, uh, uh, challenging performance for your detector. Um, so understanding the way that detectors respond to low energy uh, nuclei, low energy recoiling nuclei, is, is something that's not very easy to do, as many people in the dark matter community can tell you. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we ultimately were able to calibrate our detector. Um, but because of the, the cross-section, um, increasing like number of neutrons squared, you would be inclined to use heavier nuclei and get higher cross-sections. Uh, but with heavier nuclei, uh, your recoiling energies are lower, which means your signals are more faint and harder to see. Um, and then ultimately, the, the reason why this is all challenging is because the signal yield um, for, the, uh, for a low energy recoiling nuclei is relatively low compared to electrons, and this is ultimately a quenching process, uh, again, that we'll talk about. So, uh, these very sensitive detectors are, are necessary to make this, these observations, and any very sensitive detector uh, is, of course, also very sensitive to backgrounds. Um, and in particular, we have to be very mindful of neutron backgrounds. Uh, neutrons ultimately produce the same kind of observable signal. Uh, the elastic scattering of neutrons can give rise to a low energy recoiling nucleus, exactly like sevens. Um, and ultimately, we can use this to our advantage, and we would use the elastic scattering of nuclei to, uh, of neutrons to calibrate our detectors. Um, but this is something that uh, ultimately we have to be very mindful of when fielding any experiment um, and when uh, planning any background mitigation strategies. Uh, and then finally, you need a source of neutrinos. Um, bombs aren't really the greatest option, um, so we need to find uh, anyone who wants to measure this process needs to find a site that balances the source of neutrinos with uh, any neutron backgrounds, and which also takes into consideration the fact um, that you need an appropriate energy neutrino. Um, because of the coherence requirement, um, only uh, relatively low energy neutrinos are going to be a, a terribly great source of these interactions. Uh, as you get to higher and higher energy, the coherence will fall off. Um, so something in the neighborhood of 10 MeV is about the right energy for neutrinos. Um, so, when he was uh, making this prediction, he also had Friedman immediately recognized the potential significance, uh, as, as Mike pointed out, um, to astrophysical scenarios, in particular, core collapse supernovae. Um, in the core collapse supernovae process, um, almost all of the gravitational binding energy uh, of a star is radiated away in the form of neutrinos. Approximately 10 to the 58 neutrinos leave, uh, with about 10 to the 53 ergs, which is an esoterically large number. Um, but uh, the comparatively large sevens cross section compared to other neutrino cross sections actually presents a way where the exiting neutrinos can deposit energy back into the matter of the star. Um, they're thought to be a way which energy uh, completely escapes, but um, supernova models at the time generally failed to actually give explosions. Um, so the sevens process then affords a way where you can actually uh, sort of resume a stalled shot. So as the shock wave travels outwards from the proto-neutron star at the, core, at the center of a core collapse supernovae, um, the neutrinos actually can interact uh, in that matter, can uh, give rise to the delayed shock mechanism. Uh, and so this actually persisted for a long time as a possible explanation for the mechanism of core collapse supernovae. And uh, it's still in discussion, core collapse supernovae are, are rather complicated uh, scenarios. And it might be difficult to actually identify any single process which is responsible for the explosion, um, but certainly uh, for some, some time, uh, the sevens process was considered a, a very viable source, uh, or very important and significant reaction uh, in these events. So whatever its uh, involvement in the actual mechanism of the explosion process may or may not be, uh, sevens presents a way that we can, all, we can detect the neutrinos emitted by supernovae. Um, so supernovae are really complicated things to study. Um, like I mentioned, there's, uh, well, like I alluded to, they're, they're very dense environments, and very few things can really reliably escape them. Neutrinos are one of the only things that really can do that. Um, and they can potentially carry away a considerable amount, a considerable amount of information about the mechanism. Um, 
Um, there's uh, studies that have suggested actually that uh, observation of supernova neutrinos can uh, allow you to study the hydrodynamics that may take place um, in these complicated objects. Uh, of course, they also have stipulated that that may only be uh, available to megaton class detectors, so nothing anytime soon. Um, but nonetheless, it really underscores the fact that uh, these are possibly ways of uh, using them as a lens to, to get some insight into what's going on in these places. Um, and then there are some other interesting things that you can also do, not just learning about uh, supernovae, but some of the processes involved can ultimately give rise uh, to spectral characteristics uh, in the neutrino flux that, uh, if observed, may allow you to discern the mass hierarchy uh, of neutrinos. And this is one of the outstanding questions uh, in neutrino physics, is understand the uh, ordering of the masses that, uh, that the neutrinos have. So this is one possible way um, that, uh, that we might be able to do that. Uh, so moving on to some more general physics from SEVENS, uh, we're going to turn to a somewhat simplified differential cross-section uh, for the process. Uh, so this describes the recoil shape uh, in a detector that one might expect. Uh, it's simplified in the sense that it assumes a spherical nucleus, so even number of neutrons, even number of protons. And it assumes that there are no non-standard interactions, so no interactions in neutrinos that are beyond the standard model. Um, we're just going to use this as kind of a jumping off point to start to talk about the physics that we can see here. Um, something that you'll recognize is that there's a uh, direct dependence on the weak mixing angle. Um, and so SEVENS uh, affords a way of actually measuring the weak mixing angle with relatively low momentum transfer. Um, this is slightly lower than uh, what would be realized with uh, the Q experiment, um, and of course much higher than what can be realized with uh, atomic, atomic parity violation experiments, uh, cesium experiments. Um, now one of the interesting things about this region uh, of momentum transfer that we're able to probe, uh, first of all, um, any measurement of the weak mixing angle, which significantly differs from the standard model predictions, indicates the presence of physics beyond the standard model. But this region in particular is sensitive to the existence of uh, certain dark Z bosons. So these uh, are invoked in some theories that actually uh, explain the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon uh, and the uh, disagreement with standard model predictions that's been seen there. Um, and so this makes this particular region rather attractive. Um, atomic parity violation experiments at a very low momentum transfer are actually sensitive to a much larger parameter space for these dark bosons. Um, but ultimately, precision analysis of these uh, is a little bit complicated uh, because of the nuclear physics uncertainties. So as you get to more and more precise analyses there, you start to deal with problems because you have electron wave functions that overlap with nu uh, neutron wave functions, and of course the uh, Neutron wave functions and nuclei are not necessarily well understood, but that brings us to another place where sevens can also help, and that is in recognizing that this last term here uh, is the nuclear form factor. So nuclear form factor is a Fourier transform of the nuclear matter distribution uh, in the nucleus, and so the effective uh, the effective uh, result of including this in the sevens cross section is that infor this enforces the coherency requirement. So as you get to higher and higher values of momentum transfer, um, this starts to go to zero, and uh, this starts to kill the cross-section and keep, keep in, uh, in check the fact that the, the nucleus is actually recoiling as a whole. Um, but this actually contains in it a lot of information about the distribution of nuclear matter. Um, so there are a couple different ways that people have proposed uh, to extract this information. Um, but ultimately, uh, it comes down to expanding in moments uh, and then measuring this and looking for deviations um, from the predictions. Um, now, even though there is some sensitivity to the proton distributions, uh, proton distributions are something that we can measure with electro electron scattering. So those can be uh, contained or constrained rather well. Um, there are some experiments based on parity violating electron scattering uh, that make use of parity violation and asymmetries in electron scattering uh, measurements that can provide incredibly accurate measurements of neutron form factors for particular nu nuclei, but these are tremendously complicated undertakings. Uh, I think there, there's a result from the PREX experiment, which is the lead radius experiment uh, based at Jefferson Lab. Uh, and I think they're undertaking another measurement of uh, calcium 48 radius, uh, it's the CREX, so calcium radius experiment. Um, they ultimately will have uncertainties in the neighborhood of 2.5% or so, which uh, for the nearest time being at least, sevens will not be able to compete with, but this is a, a very unique probe, um, certainly quite complementary to parity violating uh, effects. 
Um, and it's, it's quite an, uh, interesting, um, ultimately, information that we could extract. Um, so this provides input for nuclear structure models and actually connects back to uh, the relationship with core collapse supernovae uh, because it can inform uh, the neutron star equation of state. So as you look at, as you start to understand the structure of neutron-rich nuclei, um, you can actually start to understand the, the general nuclear structure of neutron-rich matter. Um, so this can explain the neutron star equation of state, which then uh, can actually help you understand a little bit better um, the way that the sort of rebound uh, in the core flash supernova process happens. So if we move to the full version of the differential cross-section, um, uh, removing some of our constraints before, we now have vector and axial terms uh, entering from the uh, deviations from uh, this perfectly spherical nucleus. Uh, we have a lot of expressions here, but what I want to draw your attention to are these epsilon terms. So these epsilon terms uh, encode uh, deviations from the standard model. So these are non-standard neutrino interactions. Um, and they will be manifested ultimately as an overall change uh, in rate. Actually, there's some th theoretical work actually since we published uh, the result in science um, that I think actually makes use of deviations in the spectral shape to extract some information about this as well. Um, but there's actually more uh, and very, very interesting, much more physics that we can do uh, with the coherence scattering process. And I think this is probably the most uh, exciting thing that's really yet to come from coherence scattering. And that's sensitivity uh, to the uh, neutrino magnetic moment. So at very low recoil energies, um, the, uh, the, the recoil spectrum is sensitive to the magnitude of the neutrino magnetic moment. Uh, so if we see deviation from the standard model expectation at very low recoil energy, we can start to uh, make a measurement of that, of that magnitude. Now what's really interesting about this um, is that there are distinct magnetic moments which are allowed for Dirac versus Majorana neutrinos. Um, so this could help us possibly answer the question whether or not neutrinos are their own antiparticle. And there are pretty strict limits, um, I think even that were extracted this year from the poor Xeno uh, solar neutrino data, um, so whether or not sevens will be competitive in the near term uh, about this is, is pretty questionable, but there's a whole lot of potential there, um, and it's a very complementary approach to a neutrinoless double beta decay experiments, um, which are really dedicated to observing this uh, rare neutrinoless process um, that would indicate uh, that neutrinos are, are Majorana. Um, so this is a really complementary approach to something that's very interesting, um, something that I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, so moving on to some uh, earlier proposals to detect sevens. Um, so uh, in response to a prediction or to a proposal by Drukey and Sadolsky, uh, Goodman and Witten recognized that actually any detector which is sensitive to uh, low energy nuclear recoils uh, from sevens is going to be sensitive as well to uh, low energy nuclear recoils created by one like dark matter. Um, and so uh, this gave rise to uh, Ultimately, a couple of experiments were proposed here. So, Blas Cabrera et al. Uh, proposed the bolometric detection of neutrinos, and then uh, a group here um, in Chicago, of course, Bond was a part of this, um, designed ultimately what would become the COGENT experiment. Now, COGENT stands for Coherent Germanium Neutrino Technology. And these are pictures of the realizations uh, of these proposals here, but, as you may know, these are not uh, coherent scattering detectors. These wound up being, uh, these wound up having results that were exclusion limits for WIMP-like dark matter. Um, and so that makes this sort of final connection here to a lot of really new exciting physics, and that's that ultimately, uh, as large WIMP detectors become more and more sensitive, they'll advance on what is referred to as the neutrino floor. Um, and so these are some projections here for sensitivity for next generation dark matter experiments, um, all Xeon in this case, and I apologize if I've misrepresented uh, some future Xenon predictions. This is based on CDMS projections. But um, ultimately what you see here is that uh, these start to flirt with uh, this neutrino floor here. And so these are recoils that are produced by uh, solar neutrinos and also from atmospheric neutrinos and diffuse supernova background neutrinos. Of course, solar neutrinos result from the uh, primary burning processes that take place in the sun. Uh, there's the PP chains and the CNO cycles, and both of them uh, have reactions which produce neutrinos. And so it's primarily boron-8 that should start to impinge uh, on next generation dark matter experiments, but in either event, or in any event, uh, this is going to represent a background that simply can't be defeated. 
Um, there's no amount of shielding that can get rid of these neutrinos. Um, and really what it would suggest is that ultimately um, dark matter experiments need to move towards directionality, where you can sort of identify the sources of these. So if you can point towards the sun and say, don't show me events that come from here, you might be able to deal with this. But otherwise, things are going to be very challenging. Now, at the same time, this also is confirmation, uh, or will serve as confirmation, of the sensitivity of these really complicated experiments. Um, so as these uh, start to predict the uh, you know, contribution from coherent scattering, it will be heartening in some sense to see if those, those sensitivities are correct and actually start to see these. That's a very complicated or difficult to replicate in situ uh, astrophysical probe. Um, so this is something that, uh, you know, again, should start to impact uh, next generation dark matter searches. Um, so building off of the, uh, a lot of the advances that have been made by the dark matter community, um, the coherent collaboration came together in 2013, 2014, uh, bringing together a diverse group of people whose goal was to finally perform an unambiguous observation of the coherent scattering process at the Spallation Neutron Source, or the SNS, of Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, and something that's always been uh, you know, something that Coherent wants to achieve um, is a confirmation of this cross-section as well by using multiple uh, nuclear targets and detector technologies, um, observing that n squared dependence. Um, but making use of these advances from the dark matter community, of course, numerous people in the collaboration have a lot of experience in that world. Um, and also utilizing uh, a lot of the, the technology and the familiarity that our collaborators from the nuclear security world have as well. Um, and really take advantage of the Spallation Neutron Source, which is a fantastic facility. Um, so within the coherent collaboration, ultimately the pioneering Sevens detector would be uh, cesium iodide, sodium doped. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, here's a website if you're interested in more. Um, so the Spallation Neutron Source uh, is located on site at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab's campus in eastern Tennessee. Um, its primary purpose is to provide pulsed, intense neutron beams for uh, fundamental and applied material science. Um, this is the target building here in the center. Um, in the center and the heart of this target building, there is a liquid mercury target, as you can see in this photograph on the left. Um, and this liquid mercury target is bombarded uh, 60 times a second by approximately one GeV proton beam. Um, and you can see the configuration of the target building here. Uh, this is the central area. The target monolith contains the mercury target. And you have a series of uh, 24 target stations, ultimately, radiating outward uh, from that central area. Now, the 60 hertz proton beam is contained almost entirely within a 700 nanosecond window. Um, so shown on the right here uh, is a profile in time uh, as recorded by some of the diagnostic instruments of the SNS. Um, this is uh, very useful because the neutrinos that are produced at the SNS come from the decay of pions and muons, which are byproducts of the spallation process. Of course, we understand very well what the lifetimes of these particles are. So, given an understanding of what the proton timing distribution is like, we can also develop a very good understanding of what the production time of these neutrino beams is going to be. And so, in time, we have two distinct neutrino populations. We've got a prompt neutrino population associated with decay of pions, and that produces muon neutrinos. And we have a uh, delayed neutrino population consisting of anti-muon neutrinos and electron neutrinos created by the decay of muons. Uh, now, additionally, because of the size of the mercury target and the energies of the particles involved, these neutrinos mostly, almost entirely, come from the decay of particles that have already come to rest. And so kinematically, that makes the situation relatively simple. Um, and in this ideal world, we would have monoenergetic um, muon neutrinos, the prompt neutrinos, uh, at about 29.8 MeV. And we would have uh, Michel spectrum uh, delayed population neutrinos. It's very well defined and understood with an endpoint energy of just under 53 MeV. Now, of course, in the real world, things are slightly more complicated. Um, some members of the coherent collaboration, uh, primarily at the University of Florida, did some uh, Monte Carlo transport simulations starting from the bombarding proton beam and moving forward to the production of the neutrinos. Uh, you can see here the results uh, of those simulations. Uh, predominantly, uh, the, continuum the continuum energies deviating from the uh, analytical prediction are associated with the decay and flight particles. So not all of the muon and pions come fully to rest before decaying. So they um, can give rise to different energies. 
And this population here is actually associated with uh, the capture of muons which have already come to rest. So, we're going to return just for a second to the importance uh, of the timing characteristics of the SNS. Because this is uh, tremendously helpful um, in the realization of an incredibly sensitive uh, experiment. Because right at 60 hertz, we only have to look for signals 60 times a second. And um, because these things are relatively well contained in time, uh, ultimately this can realize a tremendous reduction in the backgrounds, the steady state backgrounds that we uh, may observe. Um, now it depends a little bit on the timing characteristics of the detectors that are involved, but uh, you could reasonably expect to see about a, a reduction of about a quarter of a thousand uh, in the steady state backgrounds. Um, in addition, there's a facility-wide uh, timing signal that is distributed by the SNS uh, accelerator operations. Um, and we're able to use this then to trigger our data acquisition system. Now, of all of the timing signals involved at this billion dollar facility, this is the most time critical signal uh, of everything because it serves to synchronize uh, a couple different systems which have very different response times. Um, so what that means to us is that there's going to be very, it's going to be very reliable behavior uh, from pulse to pulse and through general operation. This signal's not going to move in time. And if we understand the relationship uh, that exists between it and the arrival of protons on target, we can very well anticipate uh, where our signals are going to be in our, in our detectors. So now that we understand the source of the neutrinos, uh, we still have to find somewhere to put our detectors at the SMS. Um, so we drew on the experience uh, from a lot of our collaborators in the nuclear security world uh, and used several different uh, neutron detection systems um, throughout the entire facility. Um, for the sake of time, I can go into most of them, but I do want to talk a little bit about the coded aperture imager. In particular, what this allows us to do is reconstruct an image uh, of a setting in neutrons. And so this was deployed to the instrument floor of the SMS. And what you can see here is the image that it produced. And so you can actually see uh, SNS neutrons coming out of the target monolith. So these are prompt neutrons produced by the SMS in this collision process. And it's exactly what we don't want. So we have to remember that this is a billion dollar facility whose purpose in life is to make neutrons. And of course, we're very sensitive to them. Um, now, fortunately, uh, we wound up having uh, somewhere that we could put things, and it was in a basement hallway. Now, that's not a very glorious title, so uh, we decided to redub it Neutrino House, um, more befitting the prestige of our experiment. Um, and it's uh, very, very, very fortunate that we were able to actually uh, be located here. And I should also point out that the SMS uh, really has been tremendous and very accommodating. Um, and we're incredibly grateful for all that they've, they've done. Um, now some of the nice things about this is that there's an 8 uh, meters water equivalent overburden, which allows for a modest uh, reduction in cosmic ray backgrounds. But we also have to remember that we have about an order of, ma uh, order of magnitude of 1,000 or so reduction already, just based on the timing. Um, and another nice thing is that this actually allows us to get pretty close to the spallation target, about 20 meters at closest approach. And something that's really nice about this 20 meters uh, is that it's filled with concrete and gravel, so backfill. And concrete and gravel serve as uh, reasonably good uh, neutron moderators. So uh, these neutrons that we saw coming through in the instrument floor, if we're located here, have to pass through 20 meters of concrete before they actually get to our detectors. And that serves uh, to very substantially reduce, uh, ultimately, not only the cosmic ray backgrounds that we see here because of the modest overburden, but also a tremendous reduction uh, in the prompt neutron population that we see. Now, one of the other interesting neutron backgrounds uh, that's presented by the location of the SNS is uh, neutrino-induced neutrons. So since we're locating these, uh, these detectors in a, a neutrino-rich environment, we can actually start to have neutrinos interact in the shielding materials near our detectors and create neutrons, which can then uh, arrive in our detectors and create uh, spurious signals. Now this is incredibly difficult uh, to deal with because not only then are these neutrons going to create uh, signals that are very similar to you know, what we're expecting from sevens, but they're also going to come in time with the neutrinos. Uh, so these are very, very difficult to deal with, and uh, what you can see here actually is the theoretical prediction for the total charge current cross-section uh, on iron 56, which might be a shielding material that we would use. Um, so even though this isn't specific necessarily to the neutrino induced neutron process, it nonetheless gives you an idea about the spread and the theoretical predictions that exist for things like this. And we have both charge current uh, and neutral current interactions that can take place and give rise to these. 
Um, but the point is that theoretical predictions really don't help us too much. There's like a factor of three or so uncertainty that exists. Um, now there's a lot of actual, there's some interesting physics in uh, neutrino induced neutrons in their own right, um, not just as a background for the coherence experiment. Um, but uh, this is actually the mechanism that uh, underpins the operation of the helium and lead observatory. Uh, so this is uh, a, uh, ultimately it's an observatory meant to see supernova neutrinos, which I talked about uh, earlier, very interesting. But it's based on uh, the upper, it's based ultimately on neutrinos uh, creating neutrons in lead, um, which is really not a terribly well understood process. Um, so understanding that actually is tremendously beneficial to HALO. Um, in addition to that, neutrino induced neutrons can play a role in nucleosynthesis, so the production of heavy elements. So again, in something like a supernovae environment, you have neutron rich nuclei, um, which are uh, sort of, in, which are interacted upon by a bunch of neutrinos from the chloroplast. Um, and understanding the uh, sort of spalling of these neutrons can give rise to a lot of fission cycling and all sorts of things. So ultimately it can be beneficial uh, in this arena as well. Um, now, early uh, simulations, and this is a plot from uh, early work by Pond, um, early simulations suggested actually that neutrino-induced neutrons could be the dominant background uh, in the seven search. Uh, now, also fortunate is the fact that if we install an additional layer uh, of hydrogenous shielding material inside of high-Z material, like lead meant to shield against gammas, um, but ultimately also a seed for neutrino-induced uh, neutrons, um, we're able to cut this down. So by redesigning the shielding configurations with this in mind, uh, and putting hydrogenous material as the immediate layer surrounding our detectors, we're able to uh, you know, effectively address this, um, which is very important because, again, you know, our theoretical understanding isn't terribly great. But um, actual data, of course, is much better than any kind of simulation. And so there are a couple efforts uh, that exist within the collaboration to perform a measurement of neutrino-induced neutrons at the SNS. Uh, there's a dedicated measurement, uh, the, this here is the lead neutrino cube, uh, or noob, uh, as we call it. Um, I should also say I tweet primarily as this experiment. I forgot that I had a personal Twitter until very recently, actually, but at any rate, uh, you can see here this is the actual realization of this experiment. It's about a ton of lead uh, inside of a muon veto system, inside of uh, modular water shielding, all on top of the pallet, which makes it movable, which is very nice. Uh, and here you can see one standard undergraduate for a size comparison. So this was deployed to the SNS, but in addition, um, there was an in-situ measurement of the neutron backgrounds at the location where ultimately the CGM iodide detector would be installed. Um, so prior to the installation of the CGM iodide, uh, a slightly different shielding structure was built, um, and two uh, liquid scintillator cells, which are neutron sensitive detectors, uh, were installed in place there. Um, so this was a very useful measurement, allowed us to do a couple different things. Um, so not only are we interested in understanding and putting a limit on the neutrino-induced neutron backgrounds, but we also want to have an understanding of what kind of signals are going to come from prompt S and S neutrons. Uh, now, of course, by going into the basement, we've already substantially reduced uh, the effect that they're going to have, but they're still going to be non-negligible. Um, so this uh, installation allows us to do, actually, Let's carry out uh, a series of Monte Carlo simulations approximating uh, the uh, prompt neutron distribution as the with power law, and then ultimately doing a maximum likelihood fit uh, and establishing uh, a model or an effective model that, that matches very well um, the prompt neutron contribution that we actually see in depth. Um, and this also allows us to get a good idea of the rate that we're going to observe. Um, in addition, uh, this allows us to make a confirmation and, uh, and, understand, and confirm our understanding of the relationship between the timing of the SNS timing signal that triggers our acquisition system uh, and the actual arrival of protons on target and by proxy, uh, ultimately, where we expect to see signals. Um, so what you can see here, uh, this blue uh, dotted line is actually the contribution from neutrino-induced neutrons. Um, the, this is data here collected from the in-situ installation. Um, and this is fit uh, both with a prompt neutron shape um, and the neutrino induced uh, neutron shape and uniform background. So this really is a very powerful measurement that allows us to uh, very well constrain uh, our understanding of what the neutron backgrounds are actually in location at the SNS, exactly where the CGMI data detector is going to be, um, and with a slightly different geometry but with a good understanding of the comparison between the two. 
So now that we have a great understanding of where we're going to install this and what neutrinos we're going to use, uh, we turn our attention to the actual cesium iodide detector. Um, cesium iodide is a very attractive uh, solution for sub search for a couple of reasons. Um, cesium iodide are both uh, monoisotopic, which is great for keeping things a little bit simple, um, and ice when I'm not having too many uh, competing effects going on in calculating for cross sections. Um, they also have very similar masses. So that means that the quenching between cesium and iodide, uh, which takes place in the detector, um, the, you know, that affects ultimately the signal that we observe, we can just wind up treating these as the same targets. Um, that simplifies things tremendously. Um, also, the sodium doped version, which we ultimately used, uh, is not sensitive, uh, is not as sensitive to high energy depositions uh, because it doesn't suffer, suffer from extreme afterglow effects. So the thallium doped version can give rise, if you have a cosmic ray interaction, for instance, you can have light production that continues for a very long time following that. Uh, this can effectively blind your detector. Um, so by using the sodium doped version, uh, we can escape some of those problems. Uh, and then ultimately, um, of course, not least of all, uh, low background crystal can be, can, can be produced relatively inexpensively. Um, so this is uh, an image of the actual 14.6 kilogram crystal that was deployed to the SNS. And, uh, this is an image during the installation. This is Bjorn Scholz, uh, one of Juan's uh, soon-to-be-graduated students. Um, and this is me. Um, so prior to the detector being deployed to the SNS, there was a thorough calibration effort that took place here in Chicago. Um, a couple things were checked. Uh, of course, the uniformity of light yield along the length of the crystal. It was uh, 34 centimeters long. I wanted to make sure that the light production and the uh, light uh, measurement was uniform throughout. Um, and in addition to that, uh, a small angle Compton scattering measurement was set up with a bearing 33, a low energy gamma source, and a brilliance detector. Um, it's a type of gamma ray detector. Um, what this really allows us to do uh, is develop a, a good understanding of cuts that would allow us to reject spurious events, um, such as true dot light produced in the glass envelope of the PMT. Um, this allows us to select really just low energy events in the cesium iodide, which is incredibly advantageous. Um, and this kind of setup really allows us to get a good grip on the efficacy of those cuts, how they might affect signal, uh, and what kind of background they allow. Um, so now that we understand, so with an understanding of the low energy electron recoil signals, the last thing that we really need to get a handle on is the signal from low energy uh, nuclear recoils, of course, which is what we're going to be observing in the 7s. Um, so, we have a comparison here showing the recoil distributions for sevens for a couple of different targets. Um, now, the situation is, uh, is particularly interesting with cesium iodide because we see this line is much steeper. So, the effect of uncertainty on quenching factor, which describes the, the amount of light that we're going to see uh, after an energy deposition from low energy, low energy recoil, is that for heavier nuclei, and uncertainty uh, here translates into a much more substantial effect on the number of counts that we're actually going to observe. And you can see that for sodium, uh, uncertainty uh, on the horizontal axis really doesn't translate into a very large change in the number of counts that you might expect, but it's, uh, it's much more exaggerated in the case of cesium iodide or xenon or any sort of similarly heavy nucleus. So in order to measure this, um, the response to large nuclear recoils. Uh, we produced a neutron beam at Triangle University's nuclear laboratory, which is located on Duke University's campus, uh, using a pulsed deuteron beam incident on a deuterium gas cell. So this allows us to produce quasi-monoenergetic uh, pulsed neutron beams, uh, which exit this wall here. This is a facility known as a shielded source area. So there's a deuterium gas cell back there. Um, which is shielded by about one and a half meters or so of uh, specifically designed neutron shielding um, so that this very well collimated neutron beam comes out. Uh, it, so it interacts in the cesium iodide detector, a small uh, volume of it that we uh, had specially for this purpose. It interacts in this detector and scatters into a well-known angle into a neutron sensitive backing detector. Um, so these backing detectors allow us to tag specific energy recoils and then we can reconstruct uh, an understanding of what the response is to uh, recoils of those energies. So we did two different measurements. Um, we did a uh, measurement with Juan and Bjorn um, here, where we had sort of one, uh, one backing detector set up at a time that moved to different angles. And then we did a uh, measurement uh, when Juan and Bjorn left, where we had uh, 12 different backing detectors set up collecting data simultaneously. 
Um, ultimately, this didn't have the effect that we would like. Um, the two measurements uh, had a bit of a disagreement. Down at lowest recoil energies, we have the same downward going trend, which is actually in disagreement with uh, other literature values. But of course, we diverged uh, up in the region of interest. Um, this gave rise ultimately to the largest uncertainty uh, in the seven years old right now. Um, this is something that uh, is certainly uh, under reanalysis, um, and we really like to understand this and uh, plan another experiment to make sure that we can reconcile this and have a solid understanding of this because this is a, a really interesting capability and we need to understand what, uh, what happened here. Um, so, armed with a complete understanding of the response of the detector, uh, neutron, the neutrinos, uh, the neutron backgrounds, we turn our attention to the actual data that was collected. Um, this is a waveform from the SEVENS data run. Um, so the SNS facility timing signal would trigger this, uh, would acquire a waveform for 70 microseconds. Um, 70 microseconds was a generously long time, which allows us to define both an anti-coincidence window and a coincidence window. And within these two windows, we could define a region of interest, a signal region, if you will, uh, and a pre-trace region. The pre-trace region allows us to reject events which show evidence of afterglow. So if there happens to have been a large energy interaction preceding this, we would see a uh, trace of several single photoelectrons here, and we can reject events like that that might uh, reasonably uh, have contributions in our signal region from non-signal events. Um, both the, uh, both the anti-coincidence region and the coincidence region uh, were treated very similarly. Uh, so the regions of interest were 12 microseconds long, and ultimately, uh, when the data is sort of reduced down to its uh, analytical form, uh, or the form that's sent into the analysis, uh, we just have two pieces of information. Uh, we have the time in the region of interest uh, at which the first photoelectron signal is detected, uh, and we have the integral of that signal um, for three microseconds following the detection of that first photoelectron. Um, now again, uh, the 60 hertz uh, <clears throat> signal from the SNS triggers this, and what's very nice about this is that that 60 hertz signal also runs when the SNS is not in operation. So not only do we have an anti-coincidence region uh, taken during SNS operation, but we also have a good sample of background when there is no beam in the facility at all. Um, something that's not shown here is that the second channel of the digitizer system uh, is dedicated to the muon veto, uh, which surrounds the shielding structure and allows us to reject any interactions uh, that are caused by, or that uh, allows us to reject any events that show interactions by cosmic rays. Uh, what you can see here, uh, or shown here, are a couple different uh, stability checks and quality checks uh, that went into monitoring the, uh, the status during data taking. Um, you see that there were some periods of data taking where things were rejected for different reasons. Uh, there was a period where the DAC was damaged, a uh, period where the muon veto uh, system had some issues. Um, but generally, things perform very, very stably. Um, what's not necessarily reflected here is also the performance of the, the SNS during that time. It ran at three different energies um, with very little changes in between them. Um, so generally, the performance was very stable um, from most perspectives. So before analyzing the data, we have, we have to predict what we're going to see. Um, ultimately, we're going to do a, a rather sophisticated two-dimensional profile likelihood analysis. And to do that, we have to have actually a shape PDF, which describes our signals. So we return to the full version, uh, including uh, the non-spherical contributions here, the axial contributions, because uh, both cesium and iodide uh, have an odd number of protons. And ultimately, this allows us to predict the contributions from both uh, the prompt neutrino population and delayed neutrino population, and produce a total uh, re uh, number of photoelectrons that we expect to see um, in our signal. Now this takes into, uh, takes into consideration not just the nuclear recoil distribution that we calculate here, but also the response uh, of the detector that we've carefully, carefully calibrated a couple different ways. So we have to translate from nuclear recoil energy uh, into electron equivalent energy, which is the quenching effect, and then also in, uh, into the light needle, which is uh, carefully measured by quantum Bjorn. Um, after that, we have to take into consideration the effect of the analysis routine that's applied to each of the waveforms. Um, ultimately, there were two parallel analyses that, that were done. I'm talking today just about the uh, Chicago analysis. There was also one carried out by a, a group in Russia, a um, student in Russia. Um, but what you can see here is that there are various different cuts that were applied, uh, quality cut, uh, such as rejecting events that uh, were taken during the uh, problems with the muon veto, uh, 
uh, afterglow, which is using that pre-trace region to reject any evidence, or to reject any evidence that probably have contributions from higher energy units preceding them. Uh, Turingov, which is tuned based on the barium-133 data, uh, rejecting events that are likely uh, originating not in the detector volume itself. Uh, and then ultimately rise times, which is a, another sort of similar cut, um, trying to just select very pure good events. So, we take the uh, photo electron distribution that we calculated um, from the seventh differential cross section and we apply um, the acceptance efficiency that's expected from the analysis. And that's shown here then, the black signal is actually what we expect to see. Now I've rescaled these so they don't have the overall 66% efficiency just for the sake of visualization. Um, but once we are uh, armed with an understanding of what signal we expect, we also have to consider the backgrounds. So our background model is informed by uh, the anti-coincidence region. Um, and what you can see here is actually the background data that was collected. Um, we, uh, if we treated this as a full two-dimensional data set and treated it directly that way, uh, it's complicated by the fact that there are bins which have very little, few or zero entries. Um, what we took advantage of is the fact that the timing and uh, energy distributions were not correlated. Uh, so we projected onto the energy axis and the timing axis. Uh, we were able ultimately then to uh, play some statistical games that allowed us to develop uh, a better understanding or a better model of our background that wasn't so susceptible to, uh, to the statistical fluctuations of the, the full two-dimensional version. So, with all of this in hand, what we've got are a couple two-dimensional PDFs. Uh, so we have a prompt neutron PDF, that, and all of these are both in photoelectron space and arrival time space. Uh, we have prompts, we have sevens, we have the summed version of the seven signals, and we have a background distribution. And what we could do now is take these, project them onto the photoelectron axis and onto the time axis, and we can compare the standard model prediction uh, with the data that was actually collected. And this is what you see here. Um, so on the left-hand column, uh, this is data that was taken during beam off. Uh, so again, the SNS timing signal uh, arrives just the same as when the beam is not working as when it's on. Uh, and what you can see here is data that was taken uh, during beam on. It was plotted with the residuals of the data. So this is a straight uh, subtraction of the background. Um, this, I should say, is not a fit. Um, what is overlaid here is actually just a straight standard model prediction. <coughs> Um, you can see that it agrees pretty well, and there's pretty obvious excess uh, relative to the uh, beam off period. So, using the simple counting analysis, what we find uh, is a near four sigma um, observation of, uh, of something that agrees with the sentence prediction. And if we go to the full two dimensional profile likelihood approach, uh, which takes into consideration systematic uncertainties, uh, we find, uh, ultimately, that we uh, observe a number of counts which is consistent uh, within one sigma of the uh, prediction of the standard model and which disagrees uh, or which prefers our best fit value at a level of 6.7 sigma over the null hypothesis. Um, also, um, the uh, simple result that we've, we've uh, obtained here, the sort of first uh, crack at making this observation, already provides some non-trivial constraints or additional constraints on neutrino non-standard interactions. So what's shown here are two particular epsilon values. Uh, we recall uh, where they show up in the differential cross-section. Um, so we uh, provide an additional amount of constraint relative to the charm experiment, which was the previous best constraint that existed, on a couple of these non-standard parameters. Um, the future of coherent, there's quite a bit that's going on. Uh, I'll just be kind of brief. Cesium iodide, 14.6 uh, uh, kilogram crystal is still in place at the SNS, still collecting data. Um, we certainly hope to refine our understanding of the quenching factor and straighten up that issue, uh, and also perform a bit of a more robust analysis, which allows more parameters to float simultaneously. Um, the neutrino and neutron neutron measurement is still ongoing. Uh, germanium PPCs is uh, hopefully uh, an effort led by one here and uh, also a collaborator in NC State. Uh, will get some uh, get the ability to deploy about 10 kilograms of germanium PPCs, show a lot of the potential for carrying out something like that neutrino magnetic moment search. Um, there is also 185 kilograms of sodium iodide thallium dope, which is already deployed at the SNS and is collecting data that's appropriate to measure the uh, charge current interaction uh, on sodium or on sorry on iodine 127. Uh, eventually, we hope to convert this into a proper sevens measurement, pushing the thresholds lower. 
uh, so we can observe uh, the 7's interaction with sodium. Um, and then also presently employed, although I couldn't find a good picture of it, is the SENS-10 detector, which is 10 kilograms per neutral volume liquid argon detector. Uh, this is an effort that is uh, led by collaborators in Indiana. Um, they are at the SNS now. They are working on uh, purity issues and pushing down their threshold and working up their light yield. Um, but this is uh, primed to, to start performing well as well. Um, now there are other 7s efforts that I would be remiss not to mention. Um, right now, 14.6 kilogram detector uh, is the world's smallest neutrino detector. Um, but there are a couple that will surprise us. Um, Pine and uh, Ann Meyer and Ricochet, uh, I believe all are smaller masses. Um, these are based at uh, Fermilab and Texas A&M and uh, I guess Northwestern now. Um, so something that's really important, ultimately, you'll remember I mentioned one of the sort of guiding uh, tenets of the coherent moderation is this measurement of this n-squared cross-section dependence. Uh, ultimately, that's really the hallmark of the coherent process. Um, we have uh, you know, observed something that is a group that is a clearly a neutrino related effect and within one sigma of the uh, standard model prediction for sevens but it will be uh, important ultimately to confirm that n-squared dependence to really show uh, absolutely unambiguously uh, that it's a coherent scattering process. Um, also, it, it's, uh, to make this measurement, it's important to show that alternative detector technologies can actually carry this out, such as liquid argon detector or germanium or sodium iodide. And then there are other uh, neutrino sources that can uh, have different advantages uh, relative to the SNS. In particular, uh, reactor antineutrinos are lower energy and but much higher flux. Um, so an experiment that can su successfully deploy and observe sevens at a reactor uh, might have a good chance of measuring uh, different effects that are really sort of enhanced by the ability to get off counts. Um, so there's really uh, a, a tremendous amount of physics left to be done with sevens. We made an observation that this is really just a debutante party for the sevens process. The most exciting physics is really yet to come. Uh, I'm particularly excited about the true magnetic moment. Um, but this is a process that observed, uh, that eluded any detection effort for more than 40 years. Um, but now coherent uh, collaboration has produced a uh, measurement that shows strong evidence uh, for an event excess that is in good agreement with the standard model prediction for sevens. Um, but again, there's a lot left to come, and it's, it's very important that, uh, that other efforts continue to proceed and, and have some exciting results as well. Um, I just want to bring it back to history one more time, uh, and again quote Fred Reines and say that persistence led us from a virtually impossible experiment to one that showed considerable promise. Uh, and it was the persistence, in no small part of Juan Pregar, um, who really sort of kept that desk for a long time. Uh, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that, uh, and others who have put in a lot of effort. Um, and I just sort of came in at the end, but uh, yeah, it's um, something that I'm, I'm very, very privileged to have been a part of, and I'm certainly appreciative of all, all the persistence that was shown. So that's all. Thank you very much. That was perfect. Uh, questions? Uh, yes, Alvaro. Why? So I'm trying to understand why it took 40 years. <laughs> what did you do? Um, <laughs> no, my question was, why did it take 40 years? I mean, yeah. I get the impression it's a very nice detector one, but CCM that is not like a super highest technology thing. Um, is it? Or is it the SNS? I just wanted to understand what, what uh, so, so you're so, so before you answer the question, I just want to explain that Alvaro has just become a professor. <laughs> And so he's now asking questions the way professors ask, <laughs> rather than when he was a postdoc. So that's the edge. So, but I know you're going to handle the question brilliantly. Yeah. So you're, you're certainly right that um, in, in many ways, cesium iodide isn't exactly the most advanced detector. It's not even the most advanced detector within the coherent suite that's planned. Um, now, uh, there are certain aspects of this detector that, that are significant. Um, it was made with low background salts. Um, the copper can which enclosed it was electroformed underground. Um, it uses a super uh, a photomultiplier tube that has a super bialkali photocathode, so it's a slightly higher quantum efficiency than most standard phototubes. Um, so there are a couple features of the cesium iodide detector that, that are significant, um, but I think the SNS probably represents the most uh, significant factor in finally making this realizable. 
Um, the pulse nature of it is, is really fantastic. The fact that we're able to get relatively close to it, um, and uh, yeah, and I mean, it's, it's, it's really a lot of things that came together um, and made this easier, but it seems easy from the outside, um, but uh, it's, it's actually tremendously difficult. Also, the calibration of these detectors is, is really hard. Um, we put a lot of effort into making these quenching factor measurements, uh, and we still wound up with something that doesn't quite agree. Um, so that's something that we're still working on, um, and really underscores just how challenging those measurements are. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we're still working on that. But um, there, are, it's a it is a through and through challenging measurement. Um, it might seem easy, but it's not. Are you going to answer to give another? Oh, Paolo, you, Paolo will be kinder. Oh well, Juan, did Juan have a point? I actually answered the question similarly. It, uh, it's an alignment of things. I mean, it took 40 some years because nobody had the right combination of source and detector. They have spent 20 years trying to produce it. You know, they're using other sources, using other detectors. And finally, we found uh, an alignment of the planets in the one where everything worked out the backgrounds, the source, the detector, and everything. It was perfect. And when you look at it, it's Still 130 events, right? It's still neutrino <laughs> physics. It's going to take us a while to produce another detection, even with this idea of the source. Uh, there's a lot of physics to be done. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very hard thing. Okay, okay. So well, we wanted to add uh, one form out of the form, which I think is, was not negative, but actually positive. Because, I mean, I remember seeing. Uh, Many papers from the novel big detectors that wanted to be made with these you know, many years ago and they were unsuccessful. So the fact that actually you know, the plan was able to find this together uh, with the is, is quite I have to say. I mean, to be the first to actually measure this, even, you know, yes, I read the source, this is true, but still. Uh, Uncertainty on the, the prediction of the standard model. Um, yeah. So it, it's uh, it's a quenching factor and also a 10% uncertainty associated with the neutrino flux. Um, and the quenching factor, I'm optimistic. Um, there are a couple things uh, that were slightly different about the way that we approached this, the two measurements. Um, and I think that it's, it's possible. It, it ultimately comes down to uh, if you're configuring the uh, experiment to measure the intrinsic quantity that is the quenching factor. Uh, versus the effective quenching factor, which you might, which might be integration length dependent, uh, which might be dependent on the way that you treat waveforms, um, versus some sort of in inherent quality of the material itself, um, which might not be directly applicable given whatever analysis routine you're using. Um, and I think the two measurements uh, were a, a little bit divergent uh, in the, the outset and the way that they were approaching that. We tried to reconcile it, but it might have been that it wasn't correctly or fully reconciled. So that's that's where I think some of that discrepancy could be. Um, so ultimately, I think we can we can bring that uh, that disagreement down quite a bit. I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. And My question was more uh, specific. I mean, uh, I guess it's not a linear effect. So if you change your pension factor by 20 percent, how much does that curve change? So how much are you consistent with? Right, right. Take another assumption. Right. Um, so ultimately, the way um, that we sort of express this, uh, the express the value here is, is a disagreement. We sort of aim to make an observation measurement rather than a, a, a 
cross-section there. Um, and so the statistics that we used were, were just slightly different. Um, but ultimately, when I, when I mentioned that the, at the end, the more robust analysis that we hope to do, um, that's where uh, we really hope to have all the shapes float. Because ultimately, the punching factor doesn't change the shape of the curve very much. Um, the, the shape change is really kind of negligible, um, but it does have an overall rate effect. Um, but what we really like to do, and the, the machinery is there um, for the most part, uh, is ultimately have something that, that includes fully all of the shape variations uh, simultaneously with all the rate by variations. Um, but uh, the, the way that we've uh, attacked this observation measurement, um, the quenching factor uncertainty, uncertainty is really rolled into the, the, the standard model prediction. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's what dominates that gray band. Yeah, so the width of the the width of this gray band, which is the one sigma uh, one sigma variance of the standard model operation, is, is driven almost completely, um, or in large part, by the the quenching factor. Yeah, and we try. Are you sure the quenching factor measurement? So, <coughs> uh, because it's not just our measurement. There's, there's others done by Korean and Chinese groups, as you can see. We pragmatically assume that it's a constant over the region of interest, but we also try models where we follow the Duke the measurement or the uh, Chicago measurement, and we saw that the uncertainty was essentially a gray line. Uh, but I would like to add something. If you put things in perspective, this may look like there's too much scatter, but this is actually one of the most precise quenching factor measurements. <laughs> I mean, if you see the same thing for liquid zinc. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's catastrophic in comparison. I have to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Just are there any more questions for Grayson?